this week on the Back Table Podcast. And the thing with coaching is that we, like, as surgeons, we're supposed to have the answers, right? People turn to us for the answers when we're in the operating room. But in a coach-coachy relationship, the coach isn't supposed to have all the answers. We're supposed to ask the right questions to pull the answers from our coachee. And this has actually been one of the biggest shifts for me as a coach in that in these relationships, and when I'm doing my coach training, the coach isn't supposed to do all the talking. The coach is not supposed to talk very much at all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. Again, we have Dr. Amy Park, section head of urogynecology at Cleveland Clinic, or as our guest and her call it, the clinic. We have another great guest today, Dr. Kara King. How are you, Dr. King? Mark, oh my gosh, I'm amazing. How are you doing? I'm good. And you prefer Dr. King, Kara? Definitely Kara, yeah. Or, or just straight up King. Just take the doctor out. That's all. Dr. Kara King. Yeah. Socially, I would call you Kara, but we're being super professional here. Um, so get ready because I'm going to read uh, Dr. Kara King's intro, and then she can tell us a little bit about herself and her practice. But she's going to talk to us today about surgical coaching, which is something I'm extremely personally excited about, and I think our listeners will be interested as well. But Dr. King, but Kara is the section head. She's a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon. She is the section head of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery at Cleveland Clinic, as well as the section head for medical gynecology, and also the director for the MIGS fellowship there. She's also a member of the board of directors of the Academy of Surgical Coaching, and also has two podcasts because she's not busy enough. The host of Unscrubbed podcast, uh, the podcast for the Society for Gynecologic Surgeons, as well as Inspiration and Insights, a Cleveland Clinic podcast highlighting female physicians within the Cleveland Clinic system. Did I, did I get it all, Kara? We... You're so kind. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Absolutely. And I will tell you, it's much more stressful being on this end of the podcast than the hosting end. So I'm just going to throw that out there as well. Oh, you, ha- you, you ain't seen nothing yet. We are going to turn up the heat here pretty quick on you. It's going oh, to be rough. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. I have a uh, personal... Uh, ulterior motives for bringing you on besides the fact that we're friends. But I'm currently signed up for the coaching course at AGL. Super excited, but I need you to tell me what, I, what I'll be doing. So <laughs> so for, before we get into the coaching, though, tell us about yourself, how you got to be where you are, um, about your job, your practice, and then we'll get into coaching. Sounds amazing. Mark and Amy, again, thanks so much for the invitation to join you guys. You guys are doing amazing work, and I'm just honored to be here with you guys today. Uh, As you guys know, I am wicked excited and passionate about coaching, so I can talk for hours about this, but a bit about my journey. I don't know how far back you want me to go, but I will say, you know, this all really started with me in the lab. I was a phlebotomist for a while, then moved over to being a grossing tech for a while, thought I was going into forensic science um, when I was in my undergrad in Michigan State, started doing some field work, finding dead bodies and bugs, and it was terrifying. Like couldn't sleep. They, at they night, have a terrifying. big program there, right? At Michigan yeah. State, like the forensics. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. actually heard of that. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing program, and I loved all of the science behind it. But when we actually got into the field work stuff, I was like, "This is terrifying." So switched gears. Uh, my mom was a lab tech, needed some summer help, and went to the hospital and just fell in love with the hospital. Specifically, fell in love with the grossing lab and getting all these big, disgusting fibroids and ovaries and placentas, and I wanted to see where all these things came from. So started jumping into the operating room when I was really, really young in my career, just seeing what this whole OR experience was like. Before medical school. Yeah, before medical school. Oh, great. Yeah, exactly. The pathologists in my grossing tech lab were so good to me. They like threw OR with a couple of gynecologic oncologists, and I knew nothing and uh, just really ate it up. So Switch gears, uh, started majoring in physiology. My grades were not ready for medical school, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> At Michigan State, I was having a good time. Uh, started working a little bit, and then the rest is really history. You know, surgery's always felt really good to me. I've always been just really intrigued with pelvic anatomy and women's health in general, and I love all the advocacy that goes on behind uh, women's health in general. 
And so ultimately, it's been a, a really good fit for me. It's great. And I appreciate you sharing you know, your journey or your path or whatever, whatever you call it. I think that's a big part of why I wanted to do this. I've met so many incredible people along the way, uh, whether it's at EGL or SGS or ACOG or just in training along the way. And you, and you think, oh, this person must have just popped out like this. And you go, oh, they actually, their career looks a little less like a straight line than maybe we thought. And so I, I think that's an important part because, again, we joked about it, but like highlighting all your, just like some of your accomplishments here, right? Like that was the first like third of the show. But You're ridiculous. No, it, it, no but seriously, like we love we, we loved hearing how our, uh, our guests uh, got to their current role. And so you're now in Cleveland. Um, but how did you get involved in surgical coaching? Yeah, it's been such an amazing fit for me. So this really started when I was in Madison, Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin. I was there for five years. It was my first job after fellowship at McGee. And I've always been involved in coaching, but on the other end. So my mom's actually a certified coach, does a lot of coaching for triathletes, marathoners, that type of aspect. So I've always been coached by my mom in the athletic world. And then I caught wind of this amazing human, Dr. Caprice Greenberg. She is one of my just lifelong mentors and sponsors and coaches. And she was at UW-Madison at the time. And she has dedicated over 20 years of her work to research within coaching. Uh, she started out in Boston and then moved to Madison and really catapulted all the coaching things there. That's where the Wisconsin Framework for Surgical Coaching really started. And so I reached out to her said I was in it to win it. How can I help in this mission from God? And So unsolicited email to Dr. Greenberg, who uh, she's now with the chair at the UNC, right? I know she's yes. at Wisconsin forever, but now she's the chair of the Department of Surgery at UNC. So yeah, good get for them. But it was, hey, I think what you're doing is interesting. Can I work with you? That was it. Totally. I was like, hey, my name's King. I want to be you. Unsolicited emails can go a long way. I was doing like research on grit. I read an article about it, I think in the Atlantic. And I found Angela Duckworth's email when I was in fellowship. I was like, hey, can I use this? And she's like, sure. Like responded back and gave me a new updated version of the score. Like people are amazing. No, no, no. So, okay. So you reach out to Dr. Greenberg. Yeah. And then what? And she took me in. She was so kind to me. So they had this big type of symposium when I was there. I must have been in 2000, maybe 18, where she really brought together a lot of the big stakeholders within coaching at the time. So both from the technology side of things, the AI side of things, the business coaching side of things, and the surgical coaching side of things. And I showed up to the symposium. It was like a two or three day type of ordeal and was absolutely hooked from that point. Shortly thereafter, though, I moved. So I ended up taking a job at Cleveland and we lost touch for a little bit of time. But again, you go back to the grit. You just keep showing up, keep showing up. So I actually went back to Madison um, to give a lecture at a pain conference. And while I was in town, I called her. I was like, hey, Caprice, I'm in town. What are you up to? And she's like, come on over to my office. Let's talk. And uh, during that meeting, they were just about to launch the Academy for Surgical Coaching. It's a nonprofit organization. Went live back in uh, November of 2019. And I've been part of the board since then. I'm now vice president uh, at this time, and the rest has been history. Incredible. I love how these things come together sometimes. We all think it's just going to be impossible to get to these things. And, and, you've, and look, I don't want to undervalue hard work, and that's something you've never been shy about. I won't say you talk about it, but something all of us notice. I mean, you're an incredibly hard worker, and you, and you get things done. And that's a huge part of it. Like you said, showing up and get things done. So coaching, you know, we, all, we have an idea about our training you know, about whether it's med school or residency fellowship, about how we're taught. How is coaching different? Because it, it is obviously very different. But talk to us about the differences between our traditional models of how we make doctors and surgeons and in coaching. I love this question. And it, you're right. This coaching, when you actually understand the philosophy behind it and then apply it, it's a completely different model. And it's completely magical when you fall into this. But when you think about it, People have been using this word coaching a lot, kind of throwing it around. And a lot of the things that you hear as quote unquote coaching actually aren't quite coaching. It's more teaching and mentoring, which are both really, really important for professional development, right? But I would say within medical school, within residency, within fellowship, a lot of what we get is this area of teaching slash mentoring. So the ways that coaching is really unique is that it's really a flattened hierarchy. With teaching, oftentimes there's a teacher and there's a learner, right? So think about when you're with your, your residents or your fellows. Oftentimes, we're asking very directed questions. We're looking very, for very specific answers. And again, there's this, there's this hierarchical difference that feels 
a little bit different than this area of coaching. With mentorship, oftentimes there's also a hierarchy, whether it be a knowledge difference or a skill difference. Really what mentorship's looking at is past things that may have worked, past actions that may have worked to help dictate future outcomes. It just feels a little bit different. Now with coaching, really the coach is there to meet their coachee where they are. So it's a lot of open-ended questions. It's a lot of figuring out where your coachee's at, where their ideal state is, and really empowering the coachee to make the actions needed to close that gap. So the space of coaching is really about faculty development and how to ask the right questions. We talk about getting below the line, meaning understanding the why of your practice. So not just the what's, but the why's of your practice. And then also really giving this special space for feedback and then action planning, right? This area of accountability. So think about Again, maybe a, a trainer for working out, right? All of us, a lot of us know what we need to do to lose weight, but how do we actually have accountability to actually make real changes in that area? And that's, that's really where, um, where I think a coach can come in and make a really big difference in, in people's practices. That's fascinating. I mean, whether it's music or sports, and you know, I, I listened to uh, Dr. Justin Dimmick talk about that, and he did, a lot of, he did a lot of this work in Michigan based on the Wisconsin group. But the Otogawande article that kind of got them thinking about it. And that was, and he was on Adam Grant's podcast recently too, talking about it. Yeah. I mean, it's out there, right? And a lot of us know it makes sense. I started my practice at the University of Kentucky with not much in the way of surgical mentorship. And I watched you pit fellow grads go out there and <laughs> put out these videos that look like, I was like, I'm just going to quit. You know, like <laughs> I can't, it. I can't, I, I don't do what they do. <laughs> um, and to have someone to like, to build my practice and I've done it in the traditional way, which is, you know, try to be really safe and try to just teach yourself and watch videos and talk to people at meetings or whatever. But it's a slow process and also one that depending on the person can be more or less safe, depending on someone's, you know, self-awareness. And we all know folks who just, I'll oh, figure it out, you know, the cut and pray surgeons that are the ones that need coaches. But no, I, I, I would have loved to have had a surgical coach and I still would love to have a surgical coach. So how does one get a surgical coach? You brought up like 17 amazing points in what you just said. I don't even know where to start with a lot of these things, but I, I do want to just take one step back with Atul Gawande's work, right? He published that article in the, in the New Yorker in 2011. And a lot of us are like, absolutely, of course I want to do that right? That would completely catapult my practice. But then the operationalizing point of that is what makes it hard, right? And I'm sure we're going to get into this, but love the theory, love the concept, but how in the world do we actually operationalize that? So I, I'm sure we'll circle back to that in a moment, but that's a, that's a really good point. And the other point that I heard you bring up is just like different, different styles and how to incorporate new techniques or new procedures. And this area of self-reflection and self-assessment. And I always find it really interesting in how poor we are at self-assessment. doesn't matter where we are in our career. doesn't even matter what subspecialty we're in. Or even, even if we're in medicine or out of medicine, we're really bad at self-assessment. And oftentimes people who are farthest off in the alignment of self-assessment, I mean, the worse we are, the worse technically we are oftentimes, if that makes sense, which is, which is scary. Right. There was a study that looked at how surgeons thought of themselves. Yes. And then asked the scrub techs, <laughs> who were the best surgeons? And the ones who thought of themselves the most highly were always at the bottom of the ranking list for the scrub techs. And the ones who were kind of the middle, they're like, I think I'm okay, but like I've got things to work on were the ones that every scrub tech was like, that's the person I want to go see. Right? That's right. The ones who like are the most confident sometimes are the ones who shouldn't be. It's just wild. It's wild when you think about that because right now the way we really – apply areas that we need to work on, it is our self-assessment, right? I mean, how, how many times do we co-scrub with another surgeon? Not that often, I think, in most of our practices. Not enough. Right. And so I'm looking at myself saying, I need to improve in X, Y, or Z. I'm going to go to AAGL, sign up for post-grad course, whatever, and then improve the skill that I need to work on. But the question is, is that really where we need to work on in our practice? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> well, now I'm rethinking whether I should sign up for this coaching course. <laughs> that is the one thing you did correct. Yes, Mark. Okay, you well, should good. definitely okay, yeah. <laughs> No, we're well, good. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, when I first started, you know, Arnie Advincula gave me advice saying, listen, don't be a cowboy when you go someplace. Like, be yes humble 
have good outcomes, like you'll be faster and better later on, but one big bad outcome will ruin your practice forever. And that was great, great advice. Yes. But at the same time, everyone's like, Migs, you know, you know, this, this guy's not coming out here killing the world right now, like, you know, just crushing it right out of the box, which I believe was a smart move, but it also it's, you also feel that imposter syndrome. Like, what am I, do I deserve to have this practice, this position? I mean, it, yeah, it, it's, it's super hard. So there's a, there's a million things that I would love to have had a coach, Yes, whether it's leadership, whether it's just specifically surgical skills, whether it's all that. I mean, it, it's endless. And I'm just like, how do I yes. jump in? And my, in my chair, Dr. Wendy Hansen was just, I was like, hey, can I do this course? She's like, absolutely. Love it. Um, absolutely. So she's super, no, she's super supportive. Kara, let me just uh, jump in here and ask you about the operaization because I'm super interested in how you find people and, uh, you know, your person. I mean, I think it's just like finding your right person, your right match generally like it's hard to find the, the right yes uh, it could be across specialties just like mentors and sponsors can be across specialty but like how do you find the the person who can give you that insight or you know do you do video review like i'm just curious about all of that do they come into the or the atul Gawande piece you know i was that really struck me in the heart too when i that came out i was really excited by it and the person who came in was a retired surgeon. Yeah. Who had the time and experience and commanded respect. But like, quite frankly, I don't want to take advice from somebody who sucks. <laughs> fair. This is fair. It's a good start. That's right. That's a good start. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I'm going to be honest. You want to respect your coach. Yeah, you have to respect your coach. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who aren't good. So... This question runs really, really deep. Really good point. So I think, um, number one, when we've looked at how do you match good coach and coaches, they oftentimes have to be respected in the field. That is absolutely true. But do they need to be the best in the field? And there's some debate whether we should be really extrapolating from the athletic world, like an athletic coach to a surgical coach. I do think there's huge discrepancies between the two. But the point I do want to bring up is oftentimes a music coach or a yoga coach or a sport coach they're oftentimes not the best on the field, right? But they understand the game. They understand the field. So they have to, I think, be experts in whatever the goal is of the coachee. Right. Plenty of coaches have never played the sport, or at least not at a high level. Right. I think Yitzhak Perlman's wife is a violin player who retired to be his coach. Exactly right. So like, yeah, it's it can look a lot of different ways. So to Amy's point, like it seems like there's so many moving parts and so many variables to get to that relationship, that that right coach. And by the way, the, the word coachy is a great word. I feel like we should be <laughs> using that more often, coachy. Yeah. You know, you, you guys you bring up a really good point because I, I talked to somebody who is a journalist and he basically the journalist said to me, sometimes the best editors are not the star journalists because the star journalists, it comes easily. They're able to hit the deadlines. They know how to structure it. And like the people who have been through struggles and can coach people through are often better editors. 1000%. I mean, think about the automaticity that happens in the expert surgeon level. You sometimes can't even break things down to understand why someone else can't do the thing. Right. I can't explain to you why you're doing it wrong, but I just know that's not right. And Michael Jordan, as a basketball owner or coach, He's not had nearly the same success rate because I think he doesn't get why other people don't just do everything the way he does it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, a, there's a countless examples of that. Yeah. So I actually appreciate the people who've struggled, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. yeah thank you. I got too. plenty of that to go around. <laughs> me well, too. I mean, I, I think that, that that's that's the thing that also helps me because I, I don't think I came out of the gate like the most amazing. But, you know, I always give this analogy of like, oh, you're either born with a beat or you cultivate the beat or you have no beat. And like most of us are cultivating the beat. Like how many people are like coming out and being like the most amazing surgeon ever, like out of the box, like not, no. It wasn't me. Nope. Yeah, no, 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 nobody. Nobody comes out being like, oh, you're just the most amazing basketball player or like fill in the blank. And, you know, that's just not really possible. So that whole talent versus, you know, hard work, et cetera. But I guess getting back to the operationalizing it, I'm just curious about 
how you've been able to pair the coaches and yeah. how you've operationalized that. So we can completely value that surgeons do not have time. Like we do not have time to be in a poor match. We just don't, right? Like if I'm going to be paired with a coach, I want to have a really fulfilling time with that person and I want to work right off the bat. So with that being said, with the Academy for Surgical Coaching specifically, if people come to us and want to coach, uh, we give them an entire worksheet almost that goes through what their goals are that they're looking to get out of that coaching relationship. From there, we go to our pool of coaches. We have over 200 coaches international right now from a whole slew of subspecialties. You name a subspecialty, we have a coach within that. Now, sometimes the best match is actually outside your subspecialty, just like you mentioned, right? So if I have a coach, and my coach has been a general surgeon for many years, they have a different lens on my practice. They have a new level of curiosity, right? Things aren't the state of automaticity. But with that being said, the pillars of surgery withhold no matter what subspecialty you're in, right? Visualization, tension, countertension, hemostasis. And if you have a coach that's outside your subspecialty, they can offer insight that you may not get with somebody within OBGYN, for example. And you've had one coach throughout this time, or have you gone through a number of coaches? Number of coaches. Yeah, because your goals are going to shift. At, le at least typically they do. They're going to shift. But with that being said, I do think it's important to have a coach for some amount of time, three months, six months, 12 months. And those are the subscriptions that we offer through the Academy are typically three, six, or 12. Now, you can get a ton out of only one coaching session alone. You absolutely can. But there's this level of psychological safety. There's this really meaningful relationship that really happens with a longitudinal relationship with your coach. So I've had a few coaches throughout my career, but I think having at least some type of lifespan with that coach can be really, really powerful. Trust comes with time. Yeah. One of the challenges in training is we work with residents, some more than others, and hearing negative feedback from somebody who you've worked with once, it's hard to know what that means or tough, I guess not negative, just hard feedback. Yeah. But the, the people who I trusted the most, who I've you know, been through it with, my attendings in residency, who sat me down and gave me the real honest feedback, it means everything because of the trust, because of the relationship. I think that's incredibly powerful. And so I'm assuming you're, you, you have a coach, but also that you are a coach, right? So a coach can have a coach. And they should. Like our motto is for every surgeon a coach, right? No matter where you are in your career, in my mind, having a new lens on your practice is so incredibly powerful. And a lot of the coaching that we do that we promote is actually video-based because like you mentioned with the Atul Gawande article, I mean, that takes up a lot of your time to have somebody actually in your operating room. And to be honest, it's really limiting because if you have somebody who's retired, you'd have to find somebody in your area, right? So there's geographical limitations, there's time limitations. And to be honest, a coach, to be truly a coach, just stands in the corner, blends in, and takes notes. They're not there to interact during the procedure if you're doing it correctly. And so the video-based model really opens up coaches on an international scale. It also can help having a coach outside of your institution. There are a lot of amazing programs that are all within the institution. The University of British Columbia, headed by Jane Lee, has an amazing coach program up there, and it can be done. But there's sometimes just a little bit more like logistical, political things that can sometimes happen. For instance, if I'm being coached by my chair, is there a different lens that could potentially happen there? And so we have found that the video-based model has worked extremely well in targeting the specific parts of the procedure that we have our goals in. At opening it up to international pairing helps with time of day, right? If I want to be coached at 9 p.m., I can find somebody in Australia, which is in the afternoon, and it all works out. So it's worked really well to be more video-based versus in person. And I can see how having a coach from outside your institution can also give you a different perspective because the people in your institution may also be struggling with the same challenges that you're having. Exactly. And to have someone come from the outside and be like, actually, this is, we do it this way here, or we've seen it done a few different ways. So I, I think that would be incredible. But I think Amy brought this up earlier, you know, and, and you mentioned a little bit of it too, but like there are demands on all of us and we've, we'll talk about burnout, you know writing notes on a Sunday afternoon. He, want, he wants to do that. But we're all we're all working hard and yeah. we all have demands. Every institution is different, but the vast majority will have some clinical productivity requirements or demands. And then to spend more time on top of that, it can be challenging. So how does that become the norm? Just logistically, how do you incorporate coaching into a, a surgeon's practice? 
great question. And I think we have a couple different ways we can look at this. So number one, in my mind, it's not adding to, but it's actually replacing things that are not working well right now. So currently in the United States, we are spending $2.4 billion and 42 million hours per year on CME. And I would argue that a lot of the ways that we're spending that time and money are actually not helping our practice, right? And so I think, and you do get CME for coaching on both the coaching side and the coachee side, just for example. And so I think if we can actually shift and again, not add to, but replace things that aren't working with coaching, that's going to feel really, really good. Like, can you imagine taking one grand rounds a month and making that an hour dedicated to coaching? Or one of our fellowship meetings per month, dedicating that to coaching. I feel like that is a really easy way to integrate it and it would feel really good. So I think part of it is that. And I think also part of it is integrating it at the level of national societies. So a lot of us are already going there in person or virtually. And so again, adding some elements of coaching within that venue when we're already there, again, would be a really easy way to integrate that. And that way we're not just adding in to the, to the work, you know, the amount of work that we have to get done, but actually making it more meaningful. And I would also just like to make the point that Cleveland Clinic is doing a really fantastic job at coaching. We have a peer coaching model more for developmental coaching. And we have saved $133 million to date just on physician retention alone through coaching. So I think there's this element of coach coachy <laughs> that we feel really good, right? We feel seen. And I think if we can have increased physician retention, that is huge. Can you just uh, talk about the societal levels? Because I, I saw that when I was just perusing online about the American College of Surgeons and they have a little thing on their website about surgical coaching. How is that? Like, do you foresee your organization or your group being a part of the National Society someday? Because it's a it's like a weird intersect, right? Advocating for it. You have a, a organization do they recommend your services? You know what I'm saying? Like the institutions, but there's like pros and yeah. cons on the institutional level. Absolutely. It gets a little bit complex for sure. I think my sh the short answer is yes, absolutely. I think this could be a really powerful home for it. And I think it goes back to the ABMS vision for the future. They put this out a couple of years ago about how we really need to move away from these high stakes point in time exams and really move into this long-term type sustainable curriculum, as well as looking at our surgical procedures, right, in some way, whether, whether it be video-based or, or, or otherwise. And so we actually have paired really well with a couple different societies to date. SAGES, for example, has been very open to incorporating the Academy for Surgical Coaching. And we recently, uh, last year, put out a pilot where we took fellows and matched them with a coach during the last six months of their fellowship and then continued it for the first six months of their attending hood. So it's a 12-month coaching relationship and seeing how during that time of, of graduation, a lot of things are changing. But one thing that can oftentimes hold steady is this relationship with your national organization, right? So as you leave your institution, go to your next job, one thing that can hold true is for something like AHL or SGS or whatever national society that we have. And so I think our vision is ultimately to have some really great collaboration with the national societies. And we were just at the American College of Surgeons just a couple of weeks ago. And we're also pairing with a lot of the surgical intelligence companies. So Black Box, Theater, Care Syntax, and the ABS, the American Board of Surgeons, put out a pilot looking at video-based assessments. And with that, um, we're pairing very well with that as well because they're getting a lot of data from the video-based assessments. But we like to say, you know, that data can be really important, but unless you have a way to actually look at it in an analytical way and apply it, it doesn't mean you're going to have an improvement in performance, right? And so pairing with the ABS, pairing with the American College of Surgeons, while we're looking at these video-based assessments, these VBAs, coaching makes sense. And so it is a little bit of a discussion, like you said, Amy, but I think ultimately that's what's going to serve our members. That's what's going to serve our surgeons. And ultimately that's what's going to optimize patient outcomes. Now I think about when you mentioned like the amount of money saved by incorporating coaching, I mean, turnover is expensive, and I've given talks on burnout. I, you know, that was my senior grand rounds in residency in 2010. Was I just see? Yeah, I just met so many miserable physicians, and I was like, I'm not going to be one. I'm going to research it. But we know turnover is expensive. We know replacing a specialty surgeon can be as much as a million dollars in lost revenue. Not even just the recruiting dinners, but like not having that person there to bring in the dollars. It can be a million dollars, and so for burnout. 
simply just like, don't make them miserable. They'll stick around. You've just saved a million bucks. I can see for coaching the same thing. I mean, decreasing turnover is a huge, huge marker of a healthy organizational culture. Also, I was going to say, um, you know, what you're talking about in terms of like coming out as a new attending too, and what Kara is alluding to, you described just being cautious in your first year. But sometimes you have to know, you know, it's important to know your limits, but know that you have the skills. And I just think, you know, this is maybe a controversial opinion, but if you have a, a big complication earlier in your career, it makes you want to quit. And if you have to go through quality and safety focus practice evaluation, the FPE, it would make someone want to quit. And God forbid a lawsuit, right? Which is psychologically, emotionally, and sometimes financially de- devastating when you haven't even gotten started yet, for sure. Yeah. I, so I, I wonder about that. I could handle it at this point in my career. Of course, I still lose sleep over complications or what have you. But I do wonder about the impact of these. Like, you know, you want to improve in the process, but it's like it can feel very harsh, very, very harsh. So I've had two new partners. They're both fresh out. And my first goal was I want to be in the OR with them for all of their cases to start and then sort of peel off the minors and be with them for all the majors. So if there's ever a complication, I've got 10 years of cases to put that complication on top of. They don't. And so it allows them to sort of like ease into it in a way that I would have loved. But that, you know, so that's, uh, Amy, I think you're right on that it is a really hard time, especially a lot of us MIG surgeons are like being thrown into leadership roles. Like, hey, I'm a new division director. I'm like, what? Like, we didn't learn about this stuff. You know, usually you have a division director you work with for years who then hands it off to you. And now it's like, here's a new division, you're in charge. So there's so many stages in our career where we uh, are trying to do new things as we go. And these problems can not just be hard, they can be devastating for folks. Um, you know, Angela Chowdhury at Northwestern has this peer support program that she set up. So can you talk about what you, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but like from your understanding, Kara, like peer support versus surgical coaching, like there's probably some overlap there, but they're different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing this up. You're, You're spot on in that they're similar, but different. And Angela's program is amazing. Like She came and gave a grand rounds at the clinic. If anyone's listening wants a absolutely amazing grand rounds, please reach out to Angela. She does a really fantastic job. She has that one of those TED Med talks coming up uh, at AGL in a couple of weeks. So she knows the information inside and out. And her aspect is really, really important for a lot of things we're talking about in regard to complications and some of that peer support that you guys are referencing. I will be honest in that the Academy for Surgical Coaching has been asked to do quite a bit of that because there's, there's such a close integration between the two but we've really stayed in our lane. You know, we've really stayed in our lane and that our lane right now is really surgical coaching. And the difference is, is that it's more of a performance type coaching, right? She's doing more developmental coaching. We're looking at the performance coaching arm. And performance does not just mean technical skill. Let's be clear there, right? Technical skill is just one of the four boxes that we talk about in regard to performance in the OR. There's also the non-technical, the communication, the stress management, right? Decision-making, judgment in the operating room, that whole aspect as well. And so I would say there's a lot of overlap, but at this point, the academy is really focusing on this performance coaching arm. I would say that as we get more traction within this area, there's a high probability that we may branch out in that a little bit as we recruit more surgeons who are also trained in that aspect. Um, But right now, we're primarily in that performance arm. I find those fascinating, the four areas that you have described, because it has to do with self-regulation and also difficult to measure yes. components. I mean, like judgment and decision-making in the OR. Like, how are you able to coach somebody through that? Like, can you just give an example of a scenario or something that you, you know, for the different areas that you would say, like, this is how I would coach somebody or how you would get feedback for that? Because I'm curious. I mean, because how do you even measure that? Like, what are the metrics, you know, decision-making in the OR, like, I mean, there's people who are technically very good surgeons, but have no like judgment. Yes. And you could probably, we'd all agree that honestly, technical skills, a really small component of it, to be honest, in the operating room, right? Like that judgment and decision making can be even more important. So I'm really happy you brought this up. And I would say only about 50% of the people who come to us want that technical skill coaching. Everybody else wants these other three arms. And so The one thing I do want to bring up is you talk about like metrics, like how are you actually getting the metrics? 
we don't necessarily have metrics within these arms because our goal as coaches is, again, really to meet our coaches where they are and have them close that delta. And, and so the metrics component of it is more uh, dependent on how the coachee is feeling that their practice is improving t- to an extent. An example of this decision-making type of coaching is personally my actual favorite type of coaching. And it works really well for our residents and fellows as well because you can't really gauge that oftentimes in the OR because oftentimes you'll start taking over if they're having trouble in these areas. An example of this could be things that come to my head could potentially be idle time. So time that you're actually watching a video with your coachee, right? And the coachee will be narrating what they're doing, what they're thinking, and just having you as a coach ask the right questions to bring to the surface potentially idle time, maybe times when there's a lot of movement going on or not, but nothing's actually happening, right? And I'm guilty of this too, where I'm doing a lot of movement, I'm touching a lot of things, but the actual progression of the case isn't moving forward. And so sometimes just having the right questions to bring that up to the coachee, to have them understand what what is the source of this idle time? Am I uncomfortable with my assistant? Am I uncomfortable with my instruments? What's going on at this time that's making not much progress, right? Is it my team? Is my team switching right now? Is it three o'clock turnover? But again, just bringing the to light with your questions for the coachee to figure it out themselves of what's going on in that scenario. Another example that comes to my mind may be a complicated ureteral lysis or a complicated modified radical hysterectomy within the MIGS world, right? And so maybe if somebody's had a ureter injury and they bring that video to us, again, just reflecting on it in a way where you're asking the right questions. And oftentimes a coachee knows what's going on, right? They know why the injury happened. But just having someone sit with you and review that video with you in a non-judgmental way, right? You're both there for the same exact reason, which is to make them better, to improve their patient outcomes. It shifts the lens where you empower them that they actually have the answers. You're not there to necessarily give them the answers. There's a feedback component. So we do coach uh, and teach our coaches how to give feedback in the right way. But really what we're there to do is to create the space and to create the scaffolding where the coachee is empowered to reflect on their own practice and get below the why these different areas of non-technical skills. Does that make sense? Am I, am I making sense with that? Yeah, I, I think that what you describe, I think I am focused on the how do you gauge improvement? And it has to mm-hmm. do with personal self-discovery and growth. And, and you know, I also just am thinking of that New England Journal Bariatric Surgery Outcomes article from the Michigan Surgical Quality collaborative. And, yes, you know, they looked at videos and you could tell which surgeons had better outcomes by how technically skilled they were. There was a lot of movement. You can actually watch those videos online. And I encourage the listeners. And even when everyone sent their best video, right? Because no one's sending their like no. awful stuff. You yes. know, they're sending their best stuff. And then there was still a difference. Yeah. And you can watch those videos. And, and just like they do the crowdsource assessments of surgical skills. I mean, I don't need to be like, know the technical aspects of swimming to know who's a good swimmer or like a good basketball player. I just can tell when I watch the game, you know, <laughs> I don't even have to watch that much of it. Same thing with surgery, you know, it's it's very comparable, but, you know, they were able to equate that to better outcomes. And I'm just wondering, have we been able to equate the surgical coaching to that and improvement in technical skills, you know, when you're talking about performance-based coaching? Right, because Kara mentioned the Delta, and that's, I'm assuming that's a Delta that a coachy is working with a coach to define, but yeah, that, yeah, that's a great question, Amy. The clinical outcomes, like, or what, or what outcomes outside of just you're getting better? What can we measure to show there's a, a benefit from coaching for our patients? Show me the evidence, right? Where the hell's the evidence? <laughs> no, I, it makes sense. It makes sense to me. It really does. But I also am curious about it because we we do have data that shows that technical schools do make a difference and and a lot of that stuff about you were you just prompted me about extra motion you know like there's if you know they always uh, i remember one of my mentors in residency would talked about elegance and efficiency and the ease of surgery economy of motion so that's also goes into technical skills as well but the judgment part one of the most important things is not to do something right like the my job as a surgeon i tell people like most of my days talking people out of surgery oh you've had 19 surgeries i think we i think we've determined that study uh, has shown us that <laughs> surgery is not the answer and so you know i think that's that's hard to 
get from outcomes when you're just, uh, well, why is this person's outcomes better? Better surgeon? Well, they make smarter decisions maybe about who to take out of the OR. But, but yeah, so, all right, Kara, where's the data? Bring it. Where, where, where is the evidence? So I love the paper Amy brought up, right? That's a Brinkmeyer et al. paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the OSAT scores. And we're getting a lot more data like this being put on us from all the companies that you're that you're mentioning, Amy, right? So OSAT scores for our listeners. OSAT scores. So the, the, there's a goal scale and there's an OSAT scale amongst more. And these are really analytical, what, I guess Likert scales looking at different parts of the surgery that are graded by either a human or sometimes AI type machine learning that can grade them as well. And so what it showed though is exactly what Amy mentioned that the higher the OSAT scores, meaning the more technical skill that the surgeon had, the better the outcomes. So we know that video-based review equates to better outcomes with higher OSAT scores. We're getting a lot more data put on us for from all these different companies we're talking about. Intuitive has a ton of metrics on the robotic platform they can give to us. But like you mentioned, data alone does not necessarily mean clinical performance improvement. And so we have to find a way to take these data points and see if our, if our clinical outcomes are actually changing. We can look at things like EBL. We can look at things like operative time. And that's all really important. And we have looked at that um, a bit within the surgical coaching literature. So there was a study that was put out by Dr. Caprice Greenberg and her team back in February of 20, 2021. And they were really looking at outcomes of bariatric surgery. Their primary outcome was looking at complications, but unfortunately, the procedure changed halfway through. And so it was originally powered for laparoscopic gastric bypass, but then the bariatric community switched to sleeve gastrectomy halfway through the study, which had decreased complications, which is great for patients, but not great for the outcomes. And so we were underpowered to really look at the complication rate differences between people who were coached and not coached. But we did see a 14-minute decrease in operative time um, when everything else was controlled for. So for surgeons who were coached, their procedures were on average 14 minutes quicker than people who are not coached. And that's kind of the first step looking at this area of technical skill within the operating room translating from coaching. There's also been some studies within the plastic surgery literature. And what they've looked at is the incidence of fistula rates in cleft palate repairs, it was a small study, but within that study as well, they found that participant surgeons who were coached had a decreased fistula rate within their cleft palate repairs. So we're starting to see more data come out at people who are coached versus not coached in regard to clinical outcomes. We have all the data looking at the fulfillment of the coach and the coachee. We're looking at non-technical skills in regard to team process improvement and sign-out improvement with people who are coached. We're looking at different areas of self-assessment, right? There was a study, just like we were talking about earlier, Mark, about how OSAT scores are closer together, meaning self-assessment OSAT versus peer assessment OSAT, that score is closer for people who are being coached. We're also looking at acquisition of new skills. And so there was a, a three-pronged study looking at uh, inguinal hernia repairs from open to laparoscopic. And we've shown that with didactics, and proctorship and as coaching as well. We've moved from open to laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs. So the data is coming out, but we absolutely uh, are very eager to have more, you know, specifically complication rates decrease. And I think it's going to happen once we get this more integrated within more surgeons operating rooms. But like Amy said, it just seems so intuitive. I mean, you know, I guess there's no question that coaching will decrease the rate of ab abdominal hysterectomy rate or increase the rate of vaginal hysterectomy rate, right? I think there are countless ways that we can improve our practice. And when, you know, when you go somewhere and say we can get better, you have to be very careful that people don't think you're saying we're terrible. But, you know, this idea of yet mentality, we all have young kids and we're like trying to do that with our children too, but also our trainees. Like I care more about your progress maybe than where you are today. If I see that you care about getting better, if I see that you understand that bad things happen, I'm going to get better and try again tomorrow. Um, you know, I'm lucky I've got people in my life who have helped me understand that a little bit. But, you know, we have a lot of people we train every day, right? Students, residents, you've got fellows, both of you. How is coaching being or is it being integrated at that level, and I think we all already feel thin in our abil ability to teach our trainees. We don't maybe get enough time with them, but how can or is coaching being integrated into residency training, medical school, fellowship training? And this is where we start, Mark. This is where we start. If we start young, then it's going to catapult for when they graduate. It's just going to be part of their culture. And so I think this is a really important point that you're bringing up. 
So within uh, the residency and fellowship, so we do have a study going on right now, which probably doesn't surprise you with my fellows, looking at coaching with residents and vaginal cuff closure. So that's undergoing right now. So the fellows are coaching the residents. Exactly right. Love it. Yes, because it should be a self-fulfilled prophecy, right? And it it should be residents coaching residents, fellows coaching residents, right? Everyone's together coaching each other, raising the bar for everyone, right? We we hear that a lot where I work. And also I know that Aaron Fritz and I have talked about this too, but culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So if you have great ideas and great plans, if it's not built into the culture. Yeah. I mean, MIG surgeons can tell you all about culture, um, trying to integrate what we do into pre-existing practices and programs. But like you said, get at, get at them when they're learning how to learn. Yes. Get at them when they're learning how to become surgeons and make that part of their training. Not just like, now that you're out, you're like, wait, someone was teaching me before. Now I want to keep going. This is just, ha- this is the best way to do it. This is what we've decided. And I have, yeah, and I would say that I can promise you that if you integrate coaching into your, into your teaching, so I'm going to say this, meaning coaching of your residents, coaching of your fellows. So here I try to do about a one hour coaching session with a fellow per month. Sometimes it ends up being spaced out a little bit more than that based on time. But when I do video-based coaching sessions with my fellows, when I get in the operating room, my teaching is completely different because I'm in their head. For instance, if I'm doing video-based coaching about reuteral lysis or urinary ligation, I, when I'm in the OR, I'm just trying to keep the patient safe, right? Like I'm going to probably cut them off a little bit early or, you know, talk a little bit more. When I'm doing video-based coaching outside the OR, we have the time to dedicate to that. And I understand why they're making the moves they're making. I understand their technical, non-technical, stress management, decision-making on an entire different level. And you said an hour a month. I think when I'm thinking about this, I'm like, who's got time? But I mean, I've got an hour a month. I think most of us have an hour a month, even with multiple learners to sit down and do this. I know we talked about a company like Theater and those that are using AI to even make the video review even more seamless, right? But I'm, I'm excited to learn about coaching. I'm excited to think about having a, a coach, but also as I have a junior partner and hope to continue to have more junior partners to think about how to develop them in a way that makes them not just better surgeons for our patients, because that's obviously always goal number one, but to make it a better working environment for them. And, you know, and, and I've created that culture in my ORs and my clinics, and it's always very, 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 I, I, buy, I buy in completely to servant leadership. I mean, that's just, that, that to me is how things stay good. Um, but coaching, I feel like falls along the same lines of like, we are all part of a team. Everybody has things to contribute, but also everybody has things to learn. And so coaching, there is a bit of humility that, or not a bit of humility. I think humility seems like it would be a foundation of coaching where I don't think many surgeons are are drowning in excess of humility. Is that a nice way to say? I mean, yes, but I would say, yeah, we surgeons have egos, right? But you want a surgeon with an ego, right? You don't want a surgeon doesn't have an ego operating on you. And so- Confidence, though, and ego, I feel like are maybe there's a nuance. Like I want someone who's not like, oh, hope this goes well. No, you don't want that. But you also don't want the person who's like, don't talk to me, don't bother me, right? We, you know, in my OR, we use first names. I want, I want my med students to speak up and feel like they can help help my patient, right? So ego versus confidence, it takes a kind of person on their own to be coached. But I, like you've said, I think there is a place for teaching. And I was a clerkship director for six years. So like teaching people how to learn, teaching people how to receive feedback at the very beginning. Because if you're already a, a resident or worse faculty and you don't know how to respond to feedback, it's over. Can't help you. And the thing with coaching is that we, like as surgeons, we're supposed to have the answers, right? People turn to us for the answers when we're in the operating room. But in a coach coachy relationship, the coach isn't supposed to have all the answers. We're supposed to ask the right questions to pull the answers from our coachee. And this has actually been one of the biggest shifts for me as a coach in that in these relationships, and when I'm doing my coach training, the coach isn't supposed to do all the talking. The coach is not supposed to talk very much at all, right? That was Dr. Demick's presentation for Sages. He like every picture was somebody going like this and talking and the other person was sitting quietly. And in every instance, the coach was the one listening. 1000%. But for us, sometimes it can be hard to not just give the answer because we know it. Like a lot of us know the answer. We know why that didn't just work, what we're watching on the video, but not just to be like, you should have grabbed that to the left. What are you doing? Like, didn't you see that? And just asking the question so that so the coachee comes to it themselves. That part can be humbling because we know the answer, but just to sit on it, it's a total shift for us. 
not something that comes naturally to me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and my learners will be like, uh, yes, that's correct. Because I'm just like, do it this way. I mean, it's hard because you want to get through the day. You have another case or two and, you you know, or it's not always the best time to teach every bit, right? And so- Correct. Um, no, I, I am I am looking forward to Denver for a lot of reasons, but a lot of it is, is because I, I want to learn all about this stuff. So- Well, I, I think that the other thing I was going to say about that, the changing the culture of things is- you would assume that this is part of our training structure, but maybe it's not explicit. One of the things that struck me about what Mark Balters gave a great speech on just looking back on the arc of his career and teaching and training 35 years worth of residents and fellows. And he's, he would say, I mean, he's published like many hundreds of papers, like over 200 or 300 papers. And But he trained so many residents, so many fellows, and they all became leaders in the field. And he also trained a lot of international grads through this International Academy of Public Surgery. And he was like, you know, the people who got better were the people who wanted to get better and engaged in self-reflection. And that just strikes me a lot, like his reflection. And I know he talked to you a lot, Kara, about it because he was like the OG. Coaching before it was cool. Yeah, he would. I mean, he would have been. I mean, you probably even could potentially recruit him if you can pull him from yoga and like windsurfing. I've tried. (laughs) I've tried many times. I know my work is not done. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. But he he, he said that. And I don't know if we explicitly impart that as part of our culture of like reflection and wanting to get better and like how to approach that. So I feel like what you're describing it provides a cognitive framework for that. Yes. As about, I want to get better. I think some of the the teaching literature about breaking down the steps into like, you know, the sling is like a 20 minute procedure. And I read one of these articles, Gary Sutton broke it down into like 21 different components of the surgery. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of components. Unconscious competence, right? You just, this all of it, you just take for granted that you know it all already. Right. But there's a lot that goes into it. And teaching surgery, there's a, there's definitely a learning curve to teaching. And I'm sure there's a learning curve to coaching. And there's a learning curve to be, uh, being an attending at each stage of your career. Like you're saying, you're, you've evolved. It's such an interesting component about the, and I think that culturally we are changing. Like the culture of surgery used to be like suffer through the pain. I, you know, I'm very interested in surgical ergonomics. So people were like, oh, physical suffering is part of the job. But also like, you know, now that we're listening to what the athletes are doing, they have a, you know, a sports psychologist and physical therapist and massage therapist and, you know, all these people cryotherapist, like all these people on staff, dietitian. And, you know, they've paid attention to this for a long time, like the psychological aspect. And we have not really been doing that. Well, I think there's this, you know, there's a culture of, you know, asking for help as a sign of weakness, right? Like if you're calling me, like, so I think there's two parts of it. And I want to hear Kara's thoughts too, obviously, because she's our expert. But I always think of it like, you know, asking for help and admitting that you don't know something. It's we just, we worry about how we're going to hear about it at M&M or faculty meeting. But the other is this idea that we have, we measure everything that's easy, not what we care about necessarily, but it's all these, did you meet this milestone or did you get this score? And we're, we're cultivating, we're finding all these students who are like getting the best scores, but then we get into this world as physicians where it's not like, I don't, it's not a test. It's just every day getting better. There is no number that you get. It's very vague. And I think for a lot of the people that we attract into this field by expecting very specific numbers along the way. And all of a sudden we're like, okay, throw the numbers out. Let's just talk about how that case went. And you're like, wait, I want to know that I did it well or poorly. And so we score everything. Now we're just doing this very, I don't want to minimize what you're doing because it's not like vague. It's not esoteric, but it is not in the traditional sense. Right. Um, we're not scoring it. Well, you don't get a, a grade and then you fail and don't get to do it anymore. So do you think we're, you know, I don't you need to go down this road, but are we picking the wrong med students, right? I mean, that's another whole, a whole other conversation, whole other podcast. That's a yeah. whole other podcast. Yeah. But you bring up really good points. And, you know, Amy, I love your point about this area of reflection. And are we actually creating the space for our learners to do that? I argue no. 
And I'd say if you asked us, we'd all say, yes, that's incredibly important, right? I go home and watch my surgical videos and I reflect on what my left hand's doing versus my right hand and all those things. But we've been doing this for 10 plus years, right? And so how does someone who hasn't done this actually reflect in that way? And so I think a lot of coaching is just creating the scaffolding and the accountability to build this into our practice, right? Build the habit of this is what you do, right? And so I think you bring up a really good point there. And then Mark, to the other point that you brought up is just the idea of us calling for help in the operating room and how that's oftentimes looked at as a sign of weakness. And I agree that oftentimes feels that way. But the two points I want to bring up is that calling for help in the operating room, I think, is incredibly important when it's done when it's needed. And it also sets the culture to our learners that it's okay to do that, right? And so modeling that behavior, I think, is absolutely critical and not doing it in a way that feels embarrassed, but in a way that you're doing it for the, for the patient's best outcome. And that is just how we work as a team. And then the third part I want to bring up about that is that consultant surgeon that comes into the operating room and makes us feel not judged, who walks in, asks how they can help, right, is in it to win it with you, makes you feel like you did the right thing there, doesn't make you feel bad. That consultant surgeon is the exact person who we want to be a surgical coach with us, right? That is the person. Now, we all know who those people are because those are the people we call the second time, right? And those are the ones, and they're like, hey, thanks for calling when the train is a half a mile from the cliff, not when the train is like in the air off the cliff, right? And so all of those things we know that we see, we observe every day as surgeons, as teachers, as, as mentors. But it seems to me that coaching is the way to organize it, to schedule it in a sense, like the logistical side of it. it. It all feels very, you know, we know the ones who did it well, we know the ones who didn't do it well, and it's sort of like very free floating. But this, I love that we have now a system that exists, a framework now that exists that we can build on and uh, we have evidence now. It's not just this idea of, of go find a mentor. I was like, well, I, I didn't have one. Honestly, like I tried to find surgical mentors in my institution. There just weren't those people. Over time, I've found people along the way. But, you know, having this set up the way it is and outside of your institution, I'm, I'm, Kara, I'm extremely excited. I am because it's something we Thank all, I, I think we all want to be a part of. And the last thing before we get, let you go and get back to all your important things is how do you become a surgical coach? Yes, Mark. Thank you for asking this question. And I'd say the number one way is exactly what you're doing at AAGL in that the Academy for Surgical Coaching, we offer in-person and virtual coach training sessions. But once every couple of months, it's a six-hour session, some didactics, a lot of small group, some one-on-one -on -one sessions. And once you go through our coach training, you become a certified coach through the Academy. You join our professional roster. And then if people come to us who want a coach, that process I was talking about earlier, you become part of that roster of someone they could potentially be matched with. And we greatly value your time. We give you an honorarium for all of your work with us. Is there a fee to go through the process to become a coach? Yes, there is. So right now- right. Which I mean, it's it, there's, a, there's work involved. I mean, there should be, right? So Exactly. But the fact that you're paying back, in a sense, the time to go do it, I think that makes a lot of sense. Exactly. So we do charge $1,000 right now to go through our coach training. And- like I said, once you go through our training, you become a certified coach and the honorarium changes depending on the subscription that your coachee chooses to be matched with you. So again, we greatly value your time and you will see financial reimbursement from that as well as, as CME credit. And not that a lot of us need CME credit, but that does allow us to use CME funds. So a lot of people who are looking to pay for this, you can use CME funds for this. And I also want to bring up the point that if you're signing a new contract as a new grad or if you're changing jobs, Build this into your contract. Make this as part of what they're going to agree to offer you when you start. It's, I think that is a, a huge component of advocating for yourself. And this is going to benefit your institution, your patients, yourself. And so don't be afraid to ask for it. Well, that's why I wanted to ask you about the, the direct link with clinical outcomes, because if you have those data, it makes it so much easier to access in terms of a quality and safety perspective. So that's why I really wanted to ask, because people are going to be like, well, that's nice, but why should I volunteer up these funds or apply this money towards that cause? So, you know, I think, again, obviously you're already on it, but being able to point to those data is going to be incredibly compelling and important, as you know. Um, and I think the CME is brilliant as well, because then you can use your CME bucket of funds towards this um, incredibly important enterprise. So I um, I think the ideas have been floating around for a while, but the cultural moment 
is really ripe. You know, I think a lot of people, I mean, we're, I'm Gen X. So I think, you know, the, but, but the baby boomers, it's not like they weren't, they were against it, but I think there's just a little bit more interest in yeah this personal and professional growth arenas. And also there's a lot of coaches in the business arena, you know, a lot of leadership coaching going on. So I think that it seems like it's, it's, it's the right timing and everything. So that's great. And I will say that if there's anyone listening who wants to get this pushed throughout their institution from their departments, department-wise or personal-wise, we have packets at the Academy. We can send you all of the data. We can send you all of the publications that you can present to your chair. And I'm also always happy to give a grand rounds or come to your division meetings to help provide information as well. So the Academy, our mission is really just to give every surgeon a coach and in any way that we can help with that. Just let us know and, and we are here for it. Yeah. Look for the Academy of Surgical Coaching online. Very easy to find. I'm excited to have you back once we have the next batch of data. Once you once you, once your work progresses, you can come back and tell us all about it because I don't have any doubts that this is the way to help us all get better. This is Our patients deserve this. I think our physicians, our surgeons deserve this. I think this is exciting stuff. And I, and, and thank you so much for spending. I know time is, 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 is very valuable for everyone, but especially for, uh, especially for you. And so it means a great deal that you are so, uh, so willing to come on the show and tell us all about surgical coaching. So thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Mark and Amy. I'd rather be nowhere else other than here with you guys. So thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you soon in Denver. <laughs> I, no, it's it's we've been saying Cody Fingers Denver, right? Because it's like it's outside of it's like Aurora, and that where we're gonna be. It's like the Gaylord. Airport, so yep, the Gaylord. All right. Well, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you both soon, and uh, and I get to spend a full day in Denver at the coaching course. So I get to hopefully soon incorporate that into my practice more uh, more definitively. Can't wait. Bye, guys. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.